Thank you, Kerry, and good afternoon to all that are gathered. Um, that uh, introduction sort of raises expectations. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so thank you for the for the um, invite to be here today and to share a little bit of my my story and um, my views about the sort of role that I'm performing. Um, not just in the Aboriginal community, but uh, across community, um, and you know my, my uh, aspirations, I suppose, for you know what the future might be able to offer, um, and how we might go about you know architecting a future for Indigenous peoples in the country, and um, what are the responsibilities for all those that are gathered here today, and the general population about how we collaborate on. What a what a future might look like for um, notions of nationhood in Australia and a collective about place in society. Um, so I thought I was going to just have a like a general conversation about some of the things, and I've got a few slides that um, will prompt and um, encourage us. Um, but I am my my identity is is Yuri Order. Um, my grandfather was a, is a, or was a Wurundjeri man on uh, my father's side, born here on the, the banks of the Yarra and connected to the Corrindurk Aboriginal Reserve. Um, his wife, my grandmother, was part of the Yorta Yorta Nation, um, born on the Cumbragunda Aboriginal Reserve. Um, and uh, connected to the Mora people of the the Yorta Yorta Nation. Um, my uh, my mother was born um, on another reserve called the Munakala Aboriginal Reserve, and she was a Wamba Wamba person. Her father, um, my grandfather, was a Wong Ibong. So there's quite a lot of different identities and different relationships that are a part of our our mosaic of Aboriginal culture and identity and who we are. And we also connect the place. So we connect to Cumbragunja in a contemporary sense. But we connect to the townships of Echuca and um, Shepparton, etc. So we have that contemporary identity as well that grows with us. Um, and at all times we're trying to reconcile our place in those contemporary environments as Aboriginal people, given our, given our history and our journey. Um, so today I'm, uh, you know, I'm very conscious that I'm standing on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and um, I take, you know, feel a very personal connection to that. And when I say I acknowledge my ancestors and acknowledge my elders, both past and present, um, that it has a spiritual connection to it. Um, so, in saying that, um, thank you for for inviting me along today and for um, having this having this conversation. Um, I've titled it "Investing in Our Futures" and repositioning value um, because I think the value of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous culture. Um, has been uh, um, marginalised, um, and over the over the course of of the last hundred years or so, um, not been valued in a, in Australian society. Um, and I wanted to talk about how we might go about changing that, because I think that's that's my role as a Aboriginal person, and as a father of, of five kids, the eldest um, is 40, and the youngest is a much celebrated rapper who's um, 32. Um, and I have 10 grandchildren and one great grandchild. So, repositioning value resonates my hope for the future of, of, of um, my grandkids and 
all grandkids and their ability to um, connect and identify and be part of your grandkids. Um, so, I don't know how to drive this, but I'll let it go. Here we go. Um, so this, this is the photo of my nan and pop. And my father is standing directly behind nan. And um, I think Lois, Lois Peel, you were talking about her, her dad is two down on the right, Selwood. Um, so this is the family that Nan was born on Kamragunja and grandfather was born on Corinder in, the, in around about the mid 1880s. Um, around that time my father up the back was born on Kamragunja Aboriginal Reserve in 1897. Um, and my mother was born on Moonacullah Aboriginal Reserve on, in 1915. And a little bit, a little bit interesting in, in that story is that um, my dad drove my mother's mother to a hospital to have my mother. That's <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's sort of cradle snatching, I suppose. <laughs> and, uh, and so it, that was a part of the, the story of um, how they sort of connected. I think that's a spiritual connection meant, meant to be. <laughs> um, but it's a typical looking photo of, um, of the time, around about, around about the, about the 1915s, 1920s. And um, both of them are fluent in Yori Yori and Wurundjeri language but none of their kids speak language. Um, so the policy of dispossession of um, Aboriginal culture and identity commenced really quickly and um, very um, abruptly. Um, hence, um, that, you know, that, that was a tur very turbulent time. It was also the time of federation around the 1900s and the white Australia policy and the policies of um, uh, removal of Aboriginal kids. You know, we heard about the stolen dead. Um, so it was a time that um, you know, people were struggling to survive. That just prior to that, the Aboriginal people were being forced off lands. The unlawful um, dispossession and invasion of Aboriginal lands had taken place, um, and people were then. Um, put into what was notably, uh, I, I suppose you could call it a safe, safe house type of environment, which was the Aboriginal reserves, but it wasn't safe from government policy. It was, it was safe from the brutal attacks that were occurring. Um, and <coughs> mum and dad and uh, grandfather and grandmother witnessed those times. So, so we've come through a turbulent and a, an aggressive period, both from a policy and policy actions, and I think we're still struggling to find the right, the right a, a, a platform on which to agree on the way we've got to move forward. Um, and I think you know we've talked about treaty um, negotiations, and I'm part of a, a process that's happening in Victoria with the Daniel Andrews government around treaty. And it's trying to reconcile what was happening back in those early times that William Cooper and, and Uncle Doug Nichols and others um, were addressing as well, was to get an agreement with the, with, the, um, with the government about how we might um, protect ourselves and uh, be able to sustain our sense of culture and sense of identity. Um, but the, the no most notable policy that was in place at the time of that photo was then the policy of um, assimilation um, and the removal of Aboriginal kids. Um, and that really, I don't think, has changed. I think there's really still a, a challenge around that, that, um, that policy. And the recent um, Uluru statement 
that was rejected by um, our Prime Minister, um, talks about the inability to construct a national representative voice of Aboriginal people from which to um, converse and negotiate with levels of government. So it's the recognition really of the, the sovereignty of, of peoples, of your Yorta peoples and others, and our ability to sustain ourselves and sustain our sense of identity. The repositioning value is, um, is a proposition, I suppose, to redress that and to, um, you know, uh, address the notion of deficit that sits in the minds of the populace. Um, the deficit narrative that's, a, that's followed Aboriginal people from the time of the first arrival um, of non-Aboriginal people on, the, on, their, on our lands um, and the current method of, the method of interventions that are rife in um, the way in which Aboriginal people are being um, viewed by all levels of government. Um, so, you know, um, resourcing and policies around, around incarceration, around mental health, around um, you know, family violence and all of the sorts of poverty figures that, that describe our, our people and our nations, but really lacking in the, um, the quality and um, the sorts of data that describe the strengths of Indigenous peoples. And the, the deficit narrative and, and the, the process of, of exploitation then of the central what is it about Aboriginal culture and what is it about Aboriginal people that we can, we can identify with that has some value in the Western concepts. And hence we've sort of moved sort of into, into art and, and sport in the main. Um, and since the 70s we've been you know, really working hard to get young people into the universities and um, out into the mainstream economies. Um, but largely we've been focused on the survival. And a lot of our um, graduates are then working and <coughs> having roles in, um, in the sorts of interventions that are being applied to Indigenous people's lives. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so tackling Tackling um, notions of what's civilised and what's uncivilised. Um, tackling that notion of, of terra nullius, that this was a land that was not occupied. And it's only in very recent times that we've actually addressed, started to address those. The work around reconciliation, the approach to recognition and constitutional reform and recognition in the Australian Constitution, it's still a very heated debate and no resolution as we speak about those types of platforms and, and agreements. I think the policy legacy that we're currently as of today um, is like a cosmetic um, approach to the acknowledgement of Aboriginal people in Australian society. It doesn't really give us a sense of future and aspiration. What it does is gives us an opportunity to address the crises that we're, we're, that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Hence the fragmentation of state and Commonwealth approach, the fragmentation and siloing of bureaucracy, and the expectation that the levels of the, the, the various fragmented approaches will develop type um, consolidated mechanisms that are really about advisory bodies <coughs> and not have a, um, a legal platform on which to, to negotiate from. So we're, we're still trying to figure that out and the conversation at the moment with the Daniel Andrews government is about treaty and is about developing a framework for treaty negotiations and for us then to look at how we might um, vision a future for Yorta Yorta peoples, Aboriginal people that are connected to, in my instance, the regional economies of the Goulburn Murray. So we want it to be, we, we desperately need to be seen as a, a, as a, as a body of people that is our right to acknowledge that we are First Nations people, that for generations we've occupied the lands of the Goldman Murray as your people. We've been there for over 60,000 years. We're still sitting on country 
and it's in our interest to invest in country. And it's in our interest to invest in the regional economies, both the economic and social economies, um, and to gain the skills and the relationships that allow us to do that. Um, but it is about repositioning the value. This sort of graph that I've, I've grabbed is, is really the, the challenge that's in front of us is that on the left hand side um, we're talking about the notion of closing the gap and that black line is the is the is the is the gap line? It's the it's the national average um, pre-invasion of Aboriginal lands. Aboriginal people are experiencing a quality of life that is equal to or better than since the invasion and dispossession of Aboriginal lands. Our quality of life measures have dropped dropped down, um, and we're in a post-invasion period where we have to find a way to re reassert that dotted line. So the vision and the aspiration on that dotted line is what drives educational attainments, participation, social inclusion, economic inclusion from a rights-based approach. So the right-based is one, that we have a right to a quality of life that is equal to, um, and that we are the traditional owners, we are the sovereign people sitting on on your, your country. Now that's that's not a them and us, that's not a somebody wins, somebody loses approach. This is about how we collaboratively um, invest in the communities in which we live, how we give respect and value to each other's um, roles and our identities, etc. But we do have a a vision as a collective with Aboriginal leadership, local government leadership, um, industry leadership, the, the, the political leadership that's coming out of our, our um, arena and our educational institutions to be at one on a strategy about future design. And this notion of closing the gap is really it's got some really strong weaknesses about the gap is to is to address the measures that are Western measures of, of, of the average. They're not the, they're not talking about the deficit in cultural competency or cultural knowledge in the mainstream. It's an assimilative thinking that allows that's pushing the, the concept of, of closing the gap. I, feel, I think we can still close the gap, but I think a part of a really important part of closing the gap is the transmission of Aboriginal knowledge back to Aboriginal kids and the sharing of Aboriginal knowledge in the Western institutions. And that's been a part of the curriculum of the education continuum from early childhood right through in a, in a life, in a cycle of life. But that's not currently the case. So I would have an expectation that the graduates of the University of Melbourne would be all cult culturally competent graduates, no matter what faculty they, are, they come from, and that their professional development and their contribution to society would be underpinned by that notion of cultural competency, um, which I think is missing from the from the. Um, the conversations that are in in the policy arenas. Um, so, in the Goulburn Murray, um, at Shepparton, the Kaili Institute, which I'm part of, um, has been talking to this model with regional leadership, of, with our, um, our economic roundtable that we that we established. And the, we did a partnership with Melbourne University, so we've been partnering with Melbourne now for nearly nigh on 40 years, uh, 14 years. Um, and we've also ran an education roundtable about concepts like this. Um, we've tried to stimulate the, the, the region, not 
from a, a native title perspective or not from a land rights perspective, but from a rights perspective, but to also talk to the notion that Deloitte's access economics says that if we close the gap, if we get to that black line, it's an increase in productivity in the region by something like $150 million. So, okay, that's a really achievable target. And, you know, it, it's, you, you, you're working out of a de deficit type of environment, you're working into a, an investment model on aspirational targets for our people's engagement. Um, it's it's, it's uh, 468 extra jobs, so, but the main thing is that it's a collaborative approach, that under, the 150 million won't be achieved unless we can address cultural competency um, in the workforce and in professional development, that we can address cultural expression and cultural aspiration. So your your language is currently, um, I don't know if it's deemed extinct, but it's on the verge. Um, and over the last five years, we've been working frantically to get the Yorta language back into the homes and around the kitchen table and on the lives of Yorta Yorta kids and Aboriginal people. But it needs to be a language that has a working relationship that is received and acknowledged by the mainstream. We make up 3%, maybe 5% of the population of our area. Um, so in terms of numbers, we're quite irrelevant. To the, to the political environment, we don't actually influence votes unless we can drive an agenda that captures the imagination. Um, so the 150 million sort of concept then is, is to get attention and to say, well, as a region, how do we pursue that? What's our strategies to pursue that? And then we've got a handshake on the, on the methodologies of how we go about it. Um, and aspirationally, we, we want to move our collective 5,000 Aboriginal people in our region to targets that exceed the gap. So that's, our, that's, that's the sort of thinking around that, that design. So it's really the bottom, when we get to the dotted line, is to reach an agreement with state, Commonwealth, but reach an agreement with our regional leadership to establish a vision, establish strategies, and establish an agreement on how we're going to progress. And part of that agreement is that the sustainability of the culture and identity of the Order people is of importance to the rest of Australian society and the rest of Golden Murray people and the rest and the, the, the levels of government that are engaging with us. So, that's, that's the sort of model that we're currently involved with um, under, under a, a process that's been called Empowered Communities, where the Commonwealth and the state um, are supporting nine regions around Australia. We're the only region in Victoria, in the Golden Murray, but the regions are in Central Australia with the, the, um, on the MPY lands with the Women's Council, North East Arnhem Land, Cape York, uh, Central Coast, Gosford, Redfern, La Perouse in the city, um, Murray Bridge on the Nurundjeri, Nurundjeri people, and Sejuna. So these communities are coming together to provide a collective approach to addressing these and putting a proposition. Given the fact that we don't have a national body that's driving policy, and we don't have a national body that's collectively um, putting these propositions in front of Malcolm Turnbull or Daniel Andrews. So we're, we're doing that in spite of the, the, the void in that sort of structure. Um, this model is, is loosely the model that we're proposing. The top left-hand corner is the green, that's, that's us, that's Aboriginal people. In the Golden Murray, we're about four to five thousand. It's looked under the ABS Australian Electoral Commission would say we undercounted by around about thirty percent. Um, there's some 
research that's been developed um, that Melbourne's been involved in is talking about like in some cases 100% of, of Aboriginal births are not being recorded for various reasons. Not, not that they're not recorded, that they're not recorded as Aboriginal. Um, <clears throat> so the drop down from that green box is a regional governance model that operates in a, in a policy and strategy environment. So it's not the doing, it's not the health service delivering primary health care, it's not the legal service delivering legal services, it's a, it's a policy think tank looking at regional data, um, regional priorities, and looking at the investment that's coming in from state and commonwealth and in the region on GDP about how it all comes together to give prosperity indicators in our region. So the, the notion of a regional body um, helps us address the silos of issue-based approaches to, um, um, to Aboriginal um, issues that um, that struggle to develop a collaborative approach. So Commonwealth and State really find it hard to talk. I don't think anybody would be surprised. <laughs> and within, within governments, it's very difficult to get a collective approach between health, education, <coughs> economic development, housing, etc. And they, they actually inter interface with the Aboriginal community on their silos. And each silo is expected to develop an advisory body that can give advice, but it really, that's all it can do is give advice. It doesn't actually carry any weight in the conversation. So <clears throat> what we want to be able to do is <clears throat> develop a regional negotiations table that has the power of the Aboriginal community's elected process to sift the ne negotiations table, to look at all the policies that are impacting in our region, to collabor collaborate with funding providers, governments, NGOs, but to have at the table industry leaders, um, uh, an investment from education, schools, etc., universities, to actually talk about, in that, that blue circle is our own Albemarle data unit, so the notion of data sovereignty, the, the sorts of things that the Aboriginal community in our region will identify the things that are important that we want to measure, and that we will take ownership of that data and that we want to know who's playing in our field, who's playing in our region and what impact are you having in our region. Are you contributing to the prosperity measures that we're looking for in the execution of your resources? And we want to say that to state government and we want to be able to say that to the Commonwealth and we want to be able to say that to participating institutions sitting on in our, in our region. So the data unit, which was only established last year, produced its first community scorecard as of December. Um, and the analysis of the scorecard across 58, I think 58 different um, data recording environments. And we've had a, a lot of, I know it's been met with positivity from data custodians. So we've had to settle, settle the sort of trust relationships with data custodians to be able to, to pull together this, this, um, this unit. And we think the unit should measure at the region and provide information to the regional negotiations table about the impact of um, resource and whether that curve that I talked about, that curve to, towards um, future prosperity is actually working and that the investment of policy and the investment of resources is consistent with prosperity measures. Um, so an example of how that is operating, um, we've got a new hospital built in Shevenant. It's a $170 million addition to the, the Golden, Golden Valley Hospital. We want to apply a prosperity measure um, formula to the allocation of $170 million into the Shevenant. Um, there's a 300 million, yesterday, a $300 million train service improvement to Shepparton. How does that improve the lives of Indigenous peoples? There's a bridge built in Echuca that's $300 million. We want to know how does that in itself improve 
Aboriginal people's lives, but what the bridge or what the hospital generates, how does that improve our lives as well? The hospital says about 60, 60 to 65 percent of its workforce is graduate, is people who've attended universities. So how, many, how do we buy into that? What's our, what's our strategy for improving our access to university and our aspiration to want to achieve those types of outcomes? Um, so there's different sectors of the workforce and the, the economic profile of the region that we want to be able to strategise our engagement with. But a part of that is, is the, the reciprocity of respect and value of Aboriginal culture and identity. So when we walk into a, a room, it's not in a deficit position, which is, and we, we, it's going to take a long time to address that because the deficit has been generationally driven. It's been, it's been there since my nan and pop and it's in, in the 1900s and it's currently still sitting there. And people are largely clumsy in their exploitation of what's, what's value. And largely it attributes to cultural tourism, art and sport. Um, and that's the, mind, that's the sort of cultural mindset that we're trying to manage. Um, so the, 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 the progression is a really, um, is one of architectural design of how we're going to address that. And we've talked about constitution reform and we've talked about treaty agreements, and we've talked about recognition in... But unless we can get all of this right from the top to the bottom, it's going to be very difficult for us to sustain ourselves as a people. And the assimilation process will continue. Um, my, grand, my grandmother and grandfather lived on Cumragunja. People may have heard of you know, the William Cooper's Knuckle Dogs. 1939 was a protest where Aboriginal people walked off Cumragunja at the treatment of the, the government's mission manager and the, the removal of Aboriginal kids in an ugly and aggressive way um, and moved off Cumragunja and came to a place like Shepparton, a town. Now, when they arrived, in 1939, they sit on the local tip site, they sit on the riverbanks, and from there you can see the town lights, but you don't actually come into town um, because it's a cultural, it's a cultural chasm. You know, it's, it's, um, the work hasn't been done to prepare the ground for the relationship. And we're still working to do that. We're still working to try and build that platform build that ground for the relationship between Aboriginal <coughs> people and non-Aboriginal people in that notion of respect and sustainability of culture and, and the value of culture and identity and our contribution to the economies that we can make based on Aboriginal knowledge that is thousands of years old that has been um, disrespected in, the, in our engagement. So the regional table is about building respect, building a place for negotiation. And on the right there, that little boxes is a, just an example of regional priorities coming out of that, driven by, by robust data. Um, and out of that, then the, the service industry are um, uh, contracting in on their service agreements with state and commonwealth, et cetera, to deliver employment, housing, education, and then the cycle of that reinvests back into the data unit and tells the regional negotiations table that we're actually increasing home ownership, that we're increasing the, the medium wage level, in, that we're increasing school retention, that we're achieving higher levels of um, educational outcomes, that our social engagement is improving, that our incarceration rates are lowering. Um, so we get a collective regional approach to the health and well-being of, um, of the Golden Murray which was largely served by you know, the, town, the, the townships of um, maybe Shepparton, Echuca, Kyabram, etc., all the smaller towns. Um, 
and a lone voice there is the Cumbergundi Aboriginal Reserve that sits sort of isolated and siloed in that myriad of services of, of, of infrastructure. So it's a it's a thinking piece um, that we're putting in front of currently putting in front of state government that we're putting in front of the Commonwealth and Nigel Scullion and Malcolm Turnbull have, have said they they um, they like the concept. So having rejected the Uluru statement on national um, a national body, they're now talking about um, the, 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 the sanity, I suppose, if, for want of a better word, of a regional approach. So Commonwealth policy implemented at a regional level, regional accountability and regional ownership of strategies um, and uh, the notion then that we're measuring the, the well-being and the prosperity of all people in our region, but in particular we're keeping consistent of the, the way in which regional prosperity measures are delivered against Indigenous peoples. And we're just not measuring deficits, which is always picked up by the media and marketed to the general population because that's the sorts of information they like to hear. So, um, so that's, that's the sort of thinking that's currently developing. Um, you know, on, a, on a, another level, I'm the president of the Rumbalara Football Netball Club. And I'm looking for membership and sponsorship. <laughs> um, but it's a, the footy club is really a social engagement tool. So if Aboriginal people are not in schools, they're not in the general workforce in the numbers we want, the social engagement and social inclusion is about exclusion, that Aboriginal kids are not welcome in the nightclubs, they're not welcome in the, in the public place, that we're not a part of Rotary, we're not a part of Apex, we're not a part of RSLs, we're not a part of the sort of infrastructure that picks up and drives social engagement. Where do you go? The Rumbleau Football Club has gathered our young people um, and brought them into a social environment where mentoring, leadership, social, uh, so creating new social norms about expectations of ourselves on how we conduct business, how we conduct ourselves, how do we deal with, with racism, how do we build aspiration for engagement. Um, so the Football Netball Club has 15 teams in it and we just launched our women's team on Saturday, on Sunday. They got a Hyden, but they got a Hyden, they just couldn't kick a goal, but they're working on it. So they know what they have to do to, to kick a goal. So, but yeah, that's, that's a fantastic, because the young people are so excited. You know, they're so excited to be a part of that, that when, when they're in this place of positivity, you can, it, it, they, you can encourage people if they feel the strength of the resources and support around them to step out into uncomfortable environments and to, and to set their goals. Now, we've done that in the past where you've mentioned we set up the, um, the First Nations Credit Union. Um, the, banking, the, the banking report should have investigated the, what happened to the First Nations Credit Union because we partnered with a major body. We, we added to almost $200 million of business and then they pulled the rug out from under us and squashed our identity. Um, but what it was doing was doing cultural, doing um, financial inclusion and financial literacy in community and building people's access to jobs but teaching them how to manage their paychecks. But giving them aspirations also about, well, these are the sort of steps you need to do if you need to get a, um, if, you want, if, you, if your vision is about home ownership and engagement, and by the way, if you're gonna do that, you'll need extra skills. So you're gonna to have to go back through the university process or to TAFE or et cetera, to try and find the skills that, that match your aspirations. Um, and this has been a, um, a siloed, isolated approach for the last 14 years, but Melbourne, Melbourne University has been like a critical partner in helping us stabilise that because 
The Football Netball Club partnered with the university to develop the Academy of Sports, Health and Education. And it's currently got about 90 young people in it. And they're doing, they're doing um, uh, VCAL and VCE, but they're all they're doing Cert 2s, 3s and 4s in, and graduate, moving across into diploma courses then and off into uh, graduate. But, but um, that's a, an evolutionary process and yesterday, I'm really excited about this, yesterday the, the, the Andrews government put 21, $23 million to the development of the Manara Centre for Excellence in our region. Um, which is the partnership between the University, um, Rumbala Football Netball Club and the City of Greater Shepparton. Um, so we've got, you know, got some really, that curve, that dotted line, this is a really one of the critical in pieces of infrastructure that we think will help us drive that, that dotted line up in the, in the direction we want it to go. Um, so cult affirming culture, affirming identity, pathways to prosperity and productivity, um, a holistic approach. It's got mums and bubs and the young people that are going to be mums and dads. So it's got that conception to spirituality and death. It's got that old cycle wrapped around it about how we how we look after ourselves. And that wall that you're seeing there is really a contemporary wall. And it talks to young Aboriginal kids about Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal identity. It's very easy for say the Namurka Nathalia Shepparton Football Club to explain to their young people about who they are and where they come from. We don't have infrastructure that talks like that. But the football club is that. And so that wall has our dreaming stories of traditional identity and traditional culture which Aboriginal elders, the women um, wove. And it's got a storyline there about of, um, of uh, photos and images of Aboriginal families from like mum and my grand grandmother and grandfather um, through to contemporary images. So the journey of Aboriginal people and it's got your language and English language wrapped up in it. So it talks about their sense of who they are and it's okay to to be Aboriginal and it's okay to have this sense of like belonging, I belong in the Gold of Murray, or I belong in Shepparton, um, and this is this is where I come from. Um, but uh, attached to that is families understanding where they're going. Um, so that's that's the notion of the Manara Centre mm -hmm. for Excellence, um, and I think we're um, working with the Graduate School of Education to develop curriculum now with about the year seven, uh, years not uh, 10, 11, 12 coming out of. Um, the Manara Centre of Excellence. Um, I think that's about it, I think. Um, there we go. What do I do? <laughs> I'm in the wrong button. Wait, there we go. So that, that is the concept of the, the Manara Centre. The Rumba Football Club is up the top. Um, those buildings at the back to the right of that blue, the blue is a is a current hockey court, but the living accommodation, um, teaching centre, um, a home for uh, research and evaluation, a home for um, the policy thinking of the Kaili Institute, and a place for archiving of our materials. Um, it's a knowledge, a cultural and knowledge centre that will support professional development of teaching workforce and health workforce. It'll, it'll uh, support curriculum design, um, but it'll also support uh, mainstream, non-Aboriginal, whoever, uh, people's engagement in, 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 uh, in sport, and uh, in, uh, especially elite, elite participation in sport, and will house um, a regional sports academy that all people will access. Um, so whilst it's driven by Aboriginal leadership, it's, it's a collaborative, it's there for, for um, the whole of the Golden Murray. But it's very, it's very symbolic of um, you know, Aboriginal leadership leading on behalf of the region. 
not leading just on behalf of Aboriginal silos. Um, so we're proposing that that um, you know people will respect and value our contribution of leadership in this environment while we're building and repositioning the value of Indigenous peoples' engagement. So that's that's the centre. It was fantastic to get that allocation from the Daniel Andrews government. Um, so we look forward to now doing all of the architectural design and um, and the putting culture and and um, putting our region on the map um, and to leading being able to to have that as a way to communicate with other institutions and other pieces of infrastructure um, but to also attract people from around Australia and overseas to come to our region, spend their money, increase the wealth of the region and in turn in the formula increase our sense of wealth and prosperity.